Hi, everybody. Everybody's hiding behind their cameras right now. <laughs> I may do Welcome. the same for, for a little bit, but, but I'll be here, Sandra. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to go sneak off and clean the cat box or anything. While you're reading. <laughs> <laughs> I like sometimes when I'm going, you know, when I'm in Zoom readings, I, you know, I make dinner and listen to the reading or whatever. It's kind of great, but. We'll see if my cat Sal makes a cameo. He he gets fascinated by the Zoom screens and the chatter. So oh, yeah. he'll, come and, he'll come and hop up. Usually he hops up right on the shelf behind me. <laughs> Glumps. Glumps around. We tend to love to see uh, special appearances by pets. I, I think that's fair to say. You know, well, who doesn't really? They could be, but they're probably just gonna be clawing at the door. <laughs> they're not supposed to be in this room. So all right, shall we get started? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Maris Kreisman, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming weeks. So please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's reading for your questions, so start thinking about them now. You can put your questions into the Zoom chat at any time and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. We're glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping, Indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this one and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. Uh, throughout the event, I'll post links in the chat to buy Now We're Getting Somewhere by Kim Adonisio and Made to Explode by Sandra Beasley, both from McNally Jackson. And now I'm delighted to introduce our poets for tonight. Kim Adonisio's eighth poetry collection is Now We're Getting Somewhere. She has also published two novels, two short story collections, and two books on writing poetry. Her most recent publications are a memoir, Bukowski in a Sundress, and a book of poems, Mortal Trash. Her collection, Tell Me, was a National Book Award finalist. Her poems and essays have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Poetry, The Sun, and many anthologies. She lives in Oakland, California. And Sandra Beasley is the author of three previous poetry collections, including I Was the Jukebox, winner of the Barnard Women's Poets Prize, and one memoir. The recipient of a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, she lives in Washington, DC. So if Sandra, you would like to start us off, that would be wonderful. Yeah, uh, welcome all. I have to tell you, when I take part in these Zoom readings, I always keep my, I always stay in gallery mode because I love seeing like just the array, whether they're names or faces or or flashings of books. Thanks, Julie. Um, and I just want, oh, I love seeing the hellos come into the chat. And I just want to say I'm so, so delighted to do uh, this event and actually a few events with, with Kim. I have been admiring her work for many years. I doubt she would remember of it like years ago, I sent her a little dinged up envelope of printed out poems and she sent me back an encouraging note <laughs> back in the days. I think this was before I was with Norton actually. So I, I uh, um, just really appreciate this, this chance uh, uh, to spend time with you all and to share and to hear her read from this amazing book, which I just got this week. Um, but I'm gonna read a few poems from Made to Explode. Uh, and I think what I'll do, I will say that this is very much framed as a, a book of DC, where I've lived now for 20 years, and of Virginia, where I grew up uh, in the 20 years before that. And in that way, it's really a book that is reckoning very much with um, legacies of living in a place that is the capital city, that is in some ways Northern, that is in some ways Southern, uh, and also, um, also just living in a place that occasionally the surreal identities of patriotism, quote unquote, iconography, monuments, memorials, overlaps with this very, very gritty reality of it's the place I get my groceries, it's the place that I go to baseball games, and it's the place that I go to the theater with my dad. And I thought I would start off by reading a, a poem called Kiss Me that is, uh, it has a little bit of a surreal premise. Twice in my life, I was in a theater with a Supreme Court justice. 
And that's kind of a strange moment. And it's very exciting when you hear that, that mutter and whir of people realizing so-and-so is eight seats behind you or eight rows behind you. It's a little different uh, when you realize the particular play you're watching. And so you'll hear in this poem, the dramatic contrast between uh, having Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the house and realizing what's on stage. Kiss me. Ruth Bader Ginsburg sits in the 19th row of my heart while on stage, a woman has been conscribed to the shape of a shrew. The actress has 40 carat eyes and aquiline nose, her shoulders slight, her waist small enough. She is spanked over our hero's knee. Everyone is laughing except the conductor who must steady his baton and the house manager who has seen it before and the actors directed instead to be aghast, agape, gawking, agog, whatever Cole Porter rhymes with dismayed, and Ginsburg, who adjusts the pearl clipped to her ear. She curls the program in her lap. This is tiring, attending theaters of the heart. She doesn't relish it as Sandra Day O'Connor did, sipping Prosecco at the intermission of Porgy and Bess. The gangster's soft shoe reminding us to brush up on our Shakespeare. The actress sings, I am ashamed that women are so simple. Soon, Kate will be tamed. That's how we know the ending is happy. So there's a lot of poems in this collection that are dealing with history. And part of that was that I had done an anthology of food poems called Vinegar and Char, verse from the Southern Foodways Alliance. And to consider food is to consider history. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. And very quickly to move into thinking about the traditions that shaped how those foods were, were served. Um, so I'll just read a couple of poems that are occupying that food space. I was thinking of this one. I, I quietly um, follow Steve, Steve Gordo, the Rancho Gordo guy, Steve, um, like on, on Twitter. And I, if there's one thing that I got out of the pandemic, there were a whole lot of losses, but the gain is I really learned how to cook beans from scratch. And, uh, and I, this is an odd little nod to my, my Texan side of my family. It's a poem called In Praise of Pintos. Faziolus vulgaris, forgive these mottled punks Children burst from the pinata of the new world and their ridiculous names of Lariat, Kodiak, Othello, Burke, Sierra, Maverick. Forgive these rap scallions that would fill the hot tub with ham while their parents go away for the weekend just to soak in that salt. Forgive their climbing instinct. Forgive their ignorance of their grandparents who ennobled Rome's greatest, Fabius, Lentulus, Pisa, Cicero, the chickpea. Legume is the enclosure, fruit in pod, but pulse is the seed. From the Latin, pulse is to beat, to mash, to throb. Forgive that thirst, forgive that gallop. Beans are the promise of outlasting the coldest season. They are a wink in the palm of God. And these next couple of poems uh, swivel to thinking about the, you know, not only food in a kind of more complicated context, but also that, as I said, that, that dividing edge between Northern and Southern cultures in which I was raised. Um, I was just noticing someone was talking about that for years there was a local band named after a basketball player named Len Bias, who died somewhat tragically. And just thinking about the appropriation and the kind of um, casualness embedded in that. And it reminded me of this poem, which, which touches base on another band that kind of appropriated a name where it took me years and years and years to realize how inappropriate the, um, the borrowing was. And this is a poem that's called Nostalgia that doesn't mean it's a nostalgic poem. But weirdly enough, I, I first entered that topic through that 
that angle of access of food. Nostalgia. An adult shad has 1300 bones, but that's not why I always order it. I remember fingers of white flesh, flaky fried, or a sack of red rose slapped into a pan with a pat of butter. And I think of camping by the James River, how the sky yawned and hollered. I once loved a band named Emmett Swimming. I got lost in a crowd of teenagers inscribing each other's yearbooks in blue Bic ink, working hard for a house with fake wood trim singing that it's been a long way down, wondering how long it'd been since I'd been good. We were sweat, sweet, and dancing. We paid what we could afford at the door. Two decades later, I read that the band named themselves Emmett Swimming for Emmett Till. The lead singer says the name means a 14-year-old should be swimming in the river not dying in it. They spelled his name wrong. And once they realized that, they kept spelling his name wrong. I've got 1,290 pin bones to go. I think that some of the toughest material in this book is you know, really confronting a culture of self-congratulatory self-segregated white liberalism that I think was pretty common in Northern Virginia um, for really a, a long time. Uh, and just recognizing, you know, I see certain reactions of kind of shock and performative anger. And, and I see these like moments of reaction, like who would do that? And I, and I have to confront the fact, that, well, we did that. Uh, and, and this um, other poem that I'll read that kind of works in this vein, it's not the only theme in the book, but it is a significant one, is in reaction to uh, a couple of weeks ago when people were reacting with shock that there had been um, skits and assignments in which someone ended up, uh, quote unquote, playing the slave. We got an A minus. We, your friends, we the Virginians, we the Northern Virginians, we the 11th grade, we the choir parties, we the Madonna sing-alongs, we the third period U.S. history, we the antebellum economies, we the Sunday, the Doritos and Jolt, we the directors, we the script, we the farmers, we the farmers' wives, you, we decide, should play the cotton picker, you who vogues best of any of us. You stand in the closet with a Tylenol bottle teasing puffs of white from its open mouth. We your friends, we the Northern Virginians, we the Virginians, we the video camera waiting, we who swear this will be hilarious. The door opens, the skit begins. So uh, I'm going to read a couple of poems. I, I actually love, uh, I love opportunities to write towards anthologies because they ask us to move our attention in different directions. Uh, there was a, an anthology that I got to contribute to a few years back that was, um, they were all about still lives, Vanitas Mortz. And, and I, you know, I think the nature of those very beautiful, voluptuous, uh, arrangements of fruit and flowers, if you spend enough time with them, one of the things that you start to notice is there's often tiny elements of decay. Uh, there's bugs, there's like the one grape that's starting to shrivel, the one flower that's starting to droop. And even though they are portraits of beauty and portraits of control in the arrangement, they are also portraits of entropy and, and kind of dealing with the shock of decay. Um, which is a really weird way of segueing to what this poem's title is, which is Still Life with Sex. Uh, but, but it's a simple reality of when challenged to write about um, still lives, I thought, you know, what, what's a form of stasis? Uh, and I'm going to 
gosh, I, my husband is not in on this Zoom, but he is in the other room. I'm just going to say that um, I, I think that part of the quirky aspect of this book is just thinking about committed married life. And, uh, and sometimes those grapes are shiny and sometimes they, they start to pucker a little bit. And with that, um, still life with sex. But first, a skull grinning among the grapes. But first, hydrangea moons barely risen. But first, milky bowls congregating in the sink and sticky spoons congregating in the bowls. But first, that vegetal stink. But first, clank of pipes filling with air. But first, dirt on your end of the couch. But first, dirt from your Monday shoes. But first, a canteen of water. But first, five loggers. But first, Magnum PI. But first, Tom Selleck. But first, kiss me because you clutter the pewter. Kiss me because you track in necessary dirt. Picture a violin, then add prosciutto. We are trying to make space and hold it open. The skull that grins amongst grapes grins at us. But first, those globes of hydrangea, there they are, perfect and cratering to our touch. I'm just gonna read uh, two more poems, I think. Um, so I've talked about food in a few different contexts, celebratory, uh, troubling, uh, historical. Um, but let me, uh, as we were talking about beforehand, I have a ridiculous number of food allergies, so much so that I have a whole memoir called Don't Kill the Birthday Girl. And uh, one major shift that I've made is writing about my allergies through the lens of explaining to people who don't have allergies what they're like, and more shifting to thinking about the kind of edge of allergies, the politics of it, the politics of disability, uh, and how people want to frame disability. Um, so I'm going to read one poem from a suite of poems that deal with those themes. Uh, it comes out of a series of recommendations to me of oh, you would like this. And it was either a movie or a television show or a book. And invariably when I would tune in, I would discover that there was a person with food allergies and they died. And that was why I would be interested in it. Uh, some of this included being asked to, to blurb such items. So, um, so, you know, this is a poem that just grabs at that absurdity of thinking that I would enjoy a trope of essentially my own victimization. Death by chocolate. A man wants my take on his novel, where a wife dies with a peanut in her mouth after we've met her husband in the act with his secretary in the passenger seat of a late life convertible. A man wants my take on his novel, where the husband's marital issues are solved by her anaphylactic collapse after he serves her takeout spiked with a cashew. And for another 300 pages, he wonders, was it an accident or did I know? Somewhere out there, a man is writing a novel about a chef with a taste for adding shrimp paste to curry and his unsuspecting shellfish allergic wife, and I will be asked for my take on it. Suggestions abound, death, by ice cream, death by cake, death by cucumber, though that would take a while, perhaps gazpacho as a shortcut. Death by mango, death by Spanish omelet, death by dairy, an abstraction sexy to someone who has never side-eyed cream brought out slopping toward the coffee, who has never felt histamine's palm at her throat, who says cheese makes life worth living. These wives, I get you, women who did not grow up aspiring to be a plot device. We almost die a lot, or we die a lot, almost. We're over it. Our mouths have more to say. And I'll, I'll just finish by reading one short poem, just staying in that theme, because I, I haven't read this poem. I'm not sure if I've ever read this poem for this book, which which is, it came out in February, um, but I'll mention that the closing phrase of it was actually, for a time, the book's title. And the, as books often do, it rotated through a few titles. But I think the, 
this idea of reckoning um, is has to do so much with my thoughts on food, with history, with geographic identity. And in particular, uh, we were talking right before this started, I'm supposed to get a vaccine shot on Friday, but I don't know if I'll be able to say yes, unless it's the one shot because the peculiarity of my system is that um, that system of one shot and then two shots, and I know some of you have probably read about this, I might have an extremely exaggerated reaction to the second shot. And that's really the story of my life. I'm never afraid to do something the first time. It's sometimes the second time that hits me hard. And that um, in a way is a metaphor for how much of how we get to know the world around us. Again, I'm so grateful for this time. I can't wait to hear Kim read. An accommodation. Pistachios, buds of salt bunk, cayenne macrame of boiled crawfish, cantaloupes, tacky, thin sugar. The first time I eat a thing, I can eat anything. The allergy requires initial exposure before my mast cells gather, before my body says no. Let's consider your need to center me on the table, to call my portion naked or plain while offering others the real version. Let's examine your suggestion. We put warnings on the cabinets, attach my name to a list. First time I tasted a kind of kindness. Then came my second reckoning. All right, thank you all. I'm so glad you read that one, Sandra. I was gonna ask you to read it if you didn't read it because I love the way that works, the, the second reckoning, you know, kindness and then the second reckoning. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me. I'm so happy to be here. I love McNally Jackson. Um, I lived in New York for three years and um, we'd, we'd go haunt it now and then. The one down on, um, was it Spring Street? Can't remember where you guys were in Soho or Prince. ours. Prince Street, right, yeah. Yeah, I'm, my friend Donna Massini, the poet, lives nearby there. So that was always a good excuse when I was visiting her to stop by McNally Jackson. So. Um, Really glad to be here and to be reading with Sandra. We're also, um, you didn't grow up in the DC area, did you, Sandra? Oh, sorry, I think you're muted, so. Can you hear me? You're, you're muted, hon. Uh, okay, it just it just finally popped me the option. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, Vienna, Vienna, Virginia. And my father worked in Georgetown growing up at a law firm. So yeah. so at, not in city, but um, that's why I always say city proper since I moved in. <laughs> I wasn't born in a quadrant. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, I grew up in Bethesda, Maryland, which is a suburb of DC. So um, and we're, we're, I think, a different generation. You mentioned in one poem that your grandfather um, I, I think he was he was John Glenn's doctor or he worked for NASA and there's a poem about the astronauts and him sort of long distance checking on on Glenn and um, I just remember going to school with some of the kids of the astronauts. Um, <laughs> yeah, the McLean house was just covered with NASA memorabilia. He was a, he was a, coming out of the Navy, a, a flight surgeon who was assigned to, to monitor their care. Um, but uh, thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, just just kind of cool, you know, that we've been been inhabiting some of the same places. Um, and then you have those poems about the memorials and uh, it, the midnight Lincoln and midnight with that the Jefferson Memorial, I think, was another one. And um, just to and did you ever did you ever venture to any of the memorials at midnight? I feel like that was a a, a kind of pilgrimage that folks who grew up in the area did. That's why it struck a chord because we used to go do acid and go down to the memorials in DC when I was in high school. So, so I was like, oh, midnight, midnight at the memorial. I remember, I remember those times. Um, but the, that wasn't as interesting to write about as, as what you wrote about. So um, 
So I'm going to go ahead and, and read some poems from this book. Um, starting with Night in the Castle, which is the first piece in the book. I'm not sure what to do about that scorpion twitching on the wall. Maybe I should slam it with this book of terrible poetry or just read aloud to it until it dies of a histrionic metaphor bleeding out on the ancient stones in a five octave aria. If I get a little drunker, I might try to murder it with my sandal. I gave up on mercy a while ago. That's what happens when you live in a castle on an artist's grant. You look at the late afternoon Umbrian light smearing itself over the tomato vines and feel entitled like an underage duchess whose husband has finally died of gout, leaving her free for more secret liaisons with the court musician. She might even have poisoned the duke, the lecherous shit. It's hard to remember what life was like before this, and I don't want to. I want to stay here and poison the king next. I want to be a feared and beloved queen, ordering up fresh linens and beheadings locking up bad poets in their artisanal hair shirts, torturing academics with pornographic marionette performances. Meanwhile, the scorpion is still there twitching slightly, reciting something about violence in the prison of ego, and I can hear the clashing armies on the wide lawn outside, sinking down into history and then standing up again. Um, the end of that poem is kind of my nod to maybe an oblique nod or an opaque nod to the end of Matthew Arnold's, the famous ending of Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach. I um, wonder if I can still recite it. Ah, love, let us be true to one another for the world which seems to lay before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. So I, was, I had those armies in mind at the end of the poem, being as I was in a 15th century castle. Um, this is called Fixed and in Flux. The cicadas swarm the pines all summer the males flexing their timbles to make the horrifying sound that will attract a mate. The new people are fidgeting in strollers, running on little piston legs hard toward the street, toward the breast, and then the beer can, and soon the breast again. When one door closes, another floats down river under the night sky. Nine planets seemingly forever, and then suddenly Pluto's demoted. The king is dead, long live the king. Existentially, we're either crawling toward a top shelf margarita, being perfected by adorable six winged angels, angels, or else getting pureed in a food processor on a decapitated mountain. Meanwhile, a, a sea worm slithers through a mortgage. 72% of Americans believe in angels. No wonder that parasitic amoeba got elected. Meanwhile, a late comes to realize it's now a grenade. That reminds me a little bit of, of Sandra's poem about the yarn bombings, that ever, anything can be made to explode, which is the source of your title, which I love. Uh, this one's called Animals. Um, and it, it um, kind of responds to a, a little part of Walt Whitman. I think I could turn and live with animals. Oh, Walt, you were wrong. They aren't placid or self-contained. I just watched a spoonbill make carpaccio out of a frog and crocodiles dining on wildebeests trying to cross the Marrow River. It's wrong to say, oh, in poetry these days, which makes me want to have a loud orgasm right here in an unashamed animal way. You must have been looking at some cows on a farm, but who wants to live like that, standing around in a shed with sore tits, shitting claustrophobically, or standing around shitting and being tortured by flies and eating grass? I know you like grass, 
but it's no fun to be a pricey pre-hamburger ruminating with no TV. If you'd had a cable subscription, maybe you would have felt differently watching Nat Geo Wild and those exhausted herds on the Serengeti. Walt, I still love you, even if this instance you might have been a victim of the pastoral tradition. Let me tell you about animals. The green anaconda swallowed the young capybara whole. Oh, 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 Walt. Capybaras are the largest rodents on earth. I don't think I'd survive as an animal for long, even a large one. Look at the elephants. Imagine being murdered and becoming a doodad or furniture inlay. Walt, I actually like sweating and whining about my condition, hot flashing and bitching in my cream satin sheets, lying awake drunk and weeping in the dark. I definitely like to own more things. An electric knife sharpener, for instance, will, would come in handy for carving up the less fortunate on special holidays. I want to be lucky as long as I can. Walt, Walt, I don't think death is luckier or leads life forward like you said. I don't think I'm going to grow from the grass you love. I'm just going to have one last blackout in a dirty pink lace dress and be eaten by tiny, ugly, tiny, ugly, legless larvae. <laughs> hard string, hard string of alliteration to get out. Tiny, ugly, legless larvae. Um, okay, here's a more optimistic view of life. I actually love that section from Song of Myself about the animals. They do not sweat and whine about the condition. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. Not one of them is, I can't remember all of it, but um, not one of them is demented with the mania of owning things. Anyway, this is, um, this is High Desert, New Mexico. Temple of the Rattlesnake's religion, deluge and heat surge, crash of the atom's rupture. Night blackens like a violin and bright flower falls from the kitchens of heaven. This is where the seams begin to loosen, where you can walk for miles in any direction. Rabbit, lizard, raven, insect drone, and almost forget the shame of being human. Smoke tree, sage, not everything is broken. Horses appear at this remote cabin to stand outside and wait for you to come with a single apple. Abandon your despair, you who enter here forsaken. The wind is saying something. Listen. Um, that was written after a long time of not being able to write when I had gone to New Mexico um, to do a um, BBC radio show where we went to see Walter De Maria's uh, land art and we spent a night in this cabin in the middle of nowhere and um, and those horses were just a sort of beautiful moment um, and after that I wrote, I wrote this poem and I, I don't know where it came from but being in the desert has, has always made me feel at home and make me feel somehow right with myself in the world and so it came out of that this is more about feeling wrong this next one um, it's a New York poem signs this morning the east river ferry is just a boat pulling up to the ugly little park in williamsburg and manhattan isn't the underworld projecting its eternal office buildings into those clouds the seagull landing on my balcony isn't an image of transcendence or being destroyed by love there isn't any meaning in things there probably aren't even any things which is hard to think about and this morning I don't want to think about anything, but I do, I think about things. As each special, unique individual in the long line below my window steps onto the ferry, as rain slips down, not, not representing the many cleaved from the one and black umbrellas unfold. I think about the giant wax man in the museum with three wicks in his head slowly burning and the hollow as his face starts to melt from the inside and the heartsick woman who jumped from the bridge, hauled up and covered with a tarp on the dock. I'm sick of death and sick to death of romantic love, but I still want to 
live if only to rearrange the base metals of my depression like canned lima beans on a mid-century modern dinner plate. My last love had beautiful green eyes, eyes like two caged parrots refusing to say anything, eyes like two rivers filling with toxic runoff. Maybe later today the sun will come out and smile like a kind nanny, but it won't be a kind nanny or even a mean nanny shaking me hard. One day it will just cool like a star. When the clock says 1111, it doesn't mean the design of things has risen to the surface and been made manifest. It means I'm still here hours later watching the boats dock and then leave without me. It means the people who commuted across the river to work on Wall Street are still there, their eyes like suitcases of small unmarked bills, and everything is going to change for the worse. And uh, this is the origin of the title, which keeps flipping from ironic to hopeful and back again. Small talk. Let's skip it and get straight to the rabid dog at hand. This is some weather we're cowering from. Would you please touch my face like a blind person? I feel like a giraffe in a parking garage. Let's skip it and get straight to the death smell coming from behind the refrigerator. Can I offer you something more subtly evocative of the underlying theme of your life story? How many self-important self wounds do you have? Everything you say is tiresome. I'm going to walk away slowly and not look back. Now we're getting somewhere. Um, let's see. Ways of being lonely. Like a haunted river, no bridge wants to lay itself down over. Like a taxidermy grizzly in the student union. You cry at a frequency only subatomic insects can hear. That time with him in Houston. Sometimes you flame into a scary flower. An eruption of coherence in the postmodern seminar. You stand in a shallow creek and your reflection floats slowly downstream without you. Alcohol is your emotional support animal. The fan hums erratically. An unclaimed suitcase of miniature toiletries burst open on the baggage carousel. Like an amoeba without an e-scooter. An extra in an epic battle scene trampled by a non-equity horse. You're a red-breasted flute, but everyone else is a dowel. A zen koan blooming in the White House Rose Garden. Sun-damaged curtains in the parlor of an abandoned friendship. You're the queen, but you're a bee being sucked into the pool's filtration system. Like a version touched for the very last time. Spooky piano music rising from the dishwasher. You wake up alone to a bird reciting Keats. That makes me want to go straight to the Keatsium part of the um, manuscript, but I'll read a couple more before we get back to Keats. This is called Guitar. Sometimes it sleeps all day, sometimes it sleeps in its case all day, like a stringed vampire. In the store down the street, its friends are hanging like hams. Guitars, like hearts, can be anything. If you really want to break your lover's heart, it's simple. Just immerse yours in tepid water and walk out of the kitchen. Go call someone you always wanted and play them a song on your new guitar. Don't break your own guitar unless you happen to be a guitar god, in which case go ahead and smash it with the impunity befitting a god. Also feel free to smash your chosen people while reminding them how much you love them. My guitar is often depressed because it takes itself seriously as the instrument of a few generations of sensitive singer-songwriters. The ukulele has lately grown in popularity, but a uke is so babyish. 
Playing it is like trying to placate a god by ritual murdering a sacrificial blankie. When my guitar is sad, it glows eloquently and gro goes berserk, thinking of light thinning in a hospital gown, and the sound of paper slippers on gray linoleum, like a voice being mopped off the tiles. A guitar, like a heart, has a hole in it. It heaves out its music like a twerking volcano, like a faucet leaking bluebells in a gutted house. Heart like the last red wolf in the decimated population of eastern North Carolina looking for a mate. Heart like a target, whole like an exit wound. Play on. And this is called um, Archive of Recent Uncomfortable Emotions. I, I had the idea at one time of doing a lot more of these, so I thought of calling it Excerpts from the Archive. But I haven't written any more yet, so so far this is, this is the archive, although I know there's a lot more there to archive. The This haircut makes me feel ugly feeling. The however much I drink, I can't pretend it's love feeling. The strangled by the foul and ugly mists of vapors and iambic pentameter feeling. The, I'm sorry I gave you those blowjobs and did you not understand the meaning of reciprocal feeling. The, it's not my birthday anymore, I'm just older feeling. The looking at x-rays of my teeth feeling. The something died in your eyes and I can smell it feeling. The literary recognition might be just another shiny object feeling. The darkling I listen and right now I think it would be kind of cool to die feeling. Oh, here's Keats again. The Keats is dead feeling. The Leonard Cohen is dead feeling. The blank and blank and my blank are also quite dead feeling. The I am Jean Reese getting blotto in a dismal room in Paris with black specks on the wall feeling. The maybe I'm just getting blotto feeling. The trees are no longer my friends feeling. The my friends are no longer my friends feeling. The once I was a 19th century Russian novel, but now I'm a frozen chicken entree feeling. The I can always return this feeling in the prepaid envelope provided feeling. The I am the prepaid envelope feeling. Okay, and now more Keats. <laughs> and um, and you, you probably, I'm sure many of you are writers and uh, most of you probably know, um, it's you know, very well known that Keats went to Italy for his health and, and died there um, of, I think what was then called consumption and we would now call tuberculosis of the lungs. And uh, Severn was the artist friend who went with him and was there when he died. And um, I don't think you need to know anything else from this poem. Still time. In Severn's letters, Keats is still alive, though coughing blood. One day he's better, then things look very bad. And if you stop reading, he's still lying there, calmer again and clearer, before they take his body out and burn the wallpaper. In books you fall in love with, you always slow down a few pages before the end, but then there you are, with only the back cover blurbs that say, this story will make you cry, and maybe an outdated photo. When you photograph the famous fountain, the water stops moving, but water never really stops moving. Your plush lion swirled away, your parents floated off, okay, but also that wine stain on your shirt only looked for a minute. After the horrifying bats in the cenote, little gold-flecked fish appeared. You finally stopped sobbing in the bathroom at weddings. You can't go back to 1821 and invent streptomycin or stop the poet's kindly doctor from bleeding his patient, but you can climb the stairs to that room in Rome and see the flowers on the ceiling, the same ones Keith held for weeks in his fevered gaze. That's as close as you can get. Go home. Your miserable bitch of a neighbor is gone, carried out, and never to return. So I like to say that's kind of a silver lining poem. 
Um, but the I've I've been to the Keats Shelley house at the foot of the Spanish Steps in Rome. I think three times now, and and been to his grave as well on those visits. And it's always just so incredibly moving to be there. And I, I think I do want to read um, one more Keats poem, and then I'm going to finish with a short one. If I can find it, I don't yet know where anything is in this book. Let me consult the table of contents. I bet I can find it. I totally get this feeling. <laughs> I, was, I was shuffling <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Wait, what's in here? What did I write? And what was really disturbing was um, only recently, even after all the reading and rereading and proofreading that goes on with publishing a book, I had not noticed and to my now dismay that the word shit appears a lot. It's really disturbing me how much it appears in this book. So I'm you sorry about that. Cloud it? It happened. You didn't get a word cloud just with- I, I would say, yes, can you do that? <laughs> you can. Tell me about that, because I had no idea. We'll talk more. <laughs> I, I mean, I know, I know, you know, when I repeated Keats, and but you know, it's just in, it's like in three of the first five poems or something. And it's really, anyway. So this one, this is like trying to go back in time. This is called I Can't Stop Loving You, John Keats. Even though you've been dead for almost 200 years, I feel like maybe I could fall through a wormhole or get knocked on the head or go through some stones in Scotland and somehow make my way to you, wearing a complicated bonnet of feathers and ribbons with medicine sewn into my pantaloons under my white muslin dress. You'd fall for me and forget about Fanny Braun and the big difference in our ages because, well, because that's what I want to happen, John Keats. Not the part where your brother grows pale and mist rising from a shorn field under a sky of whirling swallows thin, and yes, I'm sorry, dies. But the part where we lie on the grass and drink French wine and you lay your head on my breast. I can feel your eyelashes against my skin, even here in the 21st century like the legs of a fly as it lands on a musk rose while a tiny chorus hymns around your head. That's how much I fancy you, John Keats, like you're an Amazon fulfillment center far out in space, and I have a Groupon code for an intergalactic shopping spree. Like you are the star of a miniseries about a romantic poet unsullied by mycobacteria, and I'm a woman from the future changing literary history forever writing your name in my diary while you steer our little boat out of Lethe and into the lilies, trailing my hand in the canonical water. Please take me away in my tight corset and wedding dress of sand. I don't want to stay in this world watching truth bound and gagged on the railroad tracks, feeling like a fish trapped in a European pedicure spa while the tiny, whining violins of privilege pay, play and beauty slowly backs away. You know, I realize now that maybe I could have deducted my trip to Scotland to take the Outlander tour on the basis um, that it inspired uh, a poem or partly inspired a poem. I just don't know where the line is with that, you know? I just feel like everything should be deductible, which is something my mother taught me um my mother used to always say to me <laughs> she used to get a lot of cash teaching tennis lessons and she used to say remember honey there's a difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance and you want to be in the right category so i kind of grew up with that notion that everything was deductible which somehow i passed on to my daughter because one day we were in the store and i was buying tampax and she looked at me and said mom is it deductible <laughs> so she was you know kind of tuned into finance early on. Um, and by the way, I really recommend the Outlander tour. I, it, um, watching that series made me do a deep dive into Scottish history, or as deep as I can go, which probably isn't that deep, actually. But um, I got really interested in Scottish history and the Battle of Culloden and, and um, that time in Scotland. Scotland. And so going on this tour, we spent a day driving around in the rain, seeing all these castles and learning a lot more about not only where things were filmed, but sort of the historical underpinnings of it all. So I'm going to end with this poem, which is called Stay. 
And one of two or three poems in this book, I think there's a section in this book called Song for Sad Girls, and I really do think of it a lot as a, as a book for girls and women, um, at, at least that I think um, there are things that they need to hear. <laughs> and and um, and I hope um, one of the things I hope for this book is that some of the poems will reach the people that need them at the right time. This is called Stay. So your device has a low battery and seems to drain faster each day. Maybe you should double your medication. You might feel queasy, but also as if the spatula flattening you to the fry pan has lifted a little. So your breath comes out scorched, so what? Inside, trust me on this, there's a ribbon of beach by a lake. In the sand, fragments of a fossilized creature resembling a tulip. Back in the Paleozoic, online wasn't invented yet, so everyone had to wander alone and miserable through the volcanic waste, or just glue themselves to a rock hoping someone would pass by. Now you can sob to an image of your friend a continent away and be consoled. Please wait for the transmissions, however faint. Listen. When a stranger steps into the elevator with a bouquet of white roses not meant for you, they're meant for you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. I think we have time for a couple of questions if anyone has a few to put in the chat. Um, if not, we yeah. can just bask in the glow of this and, uh, and enjoy. That was amazing. I just want to say, Kim, I was thinking about this, especially in the, the first section of your reading, like you're so, there are, there are poets who are in conversation with like other poets or artists or the greats, but a lot of times they do it in this really performative kind of closed off way. And I think what is so amazing is these poems you have that are in conversation with poets of previous generations, but are equally in conversation with the reader. And like, honestly, the only other person who comes to mind who does that so effortlessly is maybe Terrence Hayes. Like it's so good and it invites us in in such a beautiful way. And I'm just, I'm just curious, like, do you, do you even consciously think about that at this point? And it's also what a beautiful type of poem to be for us to be reading in pandemic time where so many of us felt starved for conversations. And that's like exactly the mode that these poems enact. Yeah, well, I feel so much that I learned to like to write from reading, you know, and and some of these writers that I go back to are the writers that I've just been in conversation with anyway, you know, which is the beautiful thing about about poems that you can be they that we are all in this conversation that has gone on for centuries, you know, and it's really not I don't really think of it as past and present, you know, I mean, obviously I do and I want to violate that barrier I wish I could but and and you know I'm sure that I probably in person there there are poets I wouldn't like and and I prefer not to meet my idols really in general you know because you you have an image of of the writer and of the the person on the page and and I I would much rather keep the relationship there you know because I don't want to spoil it in a way with really finding out anything else <laughs> um but yeah, I just, I, I just think, and, and I love Terrence Hayes. He's, you know, I, I've been reading um, very slowly and will then reread the um, sonnets the, uh, to my American assassin, the American sonnets. Assassin, from future Hayes. assassin, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, and I'm also learning a lot because there are references. He's so engaged with, with re referencing all of these things. And, um, and there are things that I didn't know. So I was constantly like Googling things and go oh okay that's what he's talking about that's what's happening here and and it just sort of the the way he's en enmeshed in that really appeals to me so so I don't know maybe that's part of it but you know I was it's you when you started out talking about history that was going to be my question for you was kind of um about how history entered your work and whether you sort of one poem came along and then you decided to make that kind of a theme because everything in your book sort of relates to the like food and then you go into the history of all of these foods in a way you know you talk about Thomas Jefferson and peaches 
And the food poems aren't just food poems. They're connected to something else, sometimes maybe more horizontally, it, like in terms of, um, of the allergies, but then also vertically in terms of the history and, and where, where our naming of things comes from and, and you know, where our monuments come from. And I just wondered if that's something that you've always thought about or, or did you sort of write a poem or two and then think this is a theme I really want to explore in this book? because it's just all over it. Yeah, I mean, I felt like I hit moments in the manuscript where if I was gonna keep writing poetry, I had to work out some hard things in that space. And I feel like for me, the pendulum of what poetry has done in my life has often swung back and forth between the refuge and the battleground. And this is a battleground book. Like I was the jukebox is a refuge book. I, I know we were talking about capybaras in the chat earlier. Cause I, you know, meaning I was working on a memoir at the same time. And so the memoir was the hard space and the I was the jukebox was the play space. Here, I set out writing food poems and I thought it was gonna be play. I really did. I really thought this was gonna be the lighter book. And then of course we were in the historical moment that we were in and I just started realizing, no, if I'm gonna write this, I gotta layer in all this history, all of this self interrogation. I, and it helped it, for better or for worse to be in DC during this time is to live with it. I mean, it just literally, I, I had to keep some of my wonderful students are tuned in. I had to keep making uh, apologies because I was a lo losing internet. There was constant helicopters. I was literally having like a, a, a coup attempt six blocks from where I live and trying to teach through all of that. I mean, and, and yes, the, the book had been set by then, but the poems were written in the times leading up to that. And, and I just, um, yeah. So I, 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 just, I just thrashed it out. And I think some of the poems show that struggle, uh, but, but to not take into history, to not take history into account now, you know, with the, the place that I'm at, I, I just, I, why, why, you know, like, why not? Like, and, and so I, I just had to um, write through some very difficult topics and then also try to locate joy and locate a life commitment, you know, and like try to try to thrive like we're all desperately trying to do in this time. Um, I noticed we both use anaphora. We both use like parallel structure sometimes. And I, is that something that you feel like you've been working with for a long time in your work? I have my own opinions as a big fan, but I'm just curious to hear you talk about it. Oh, so, yeah. I, I mean, I love anaphora. It's just such a great trigger, you know. It's yeah. just, it's a, not only just, just something that gets things going, but for me, it's also a way to move sort of this way rather than, you know, than the narrative, like this happened and then this happened and then this happened. It's a way to to move more lyrically so that I can pull in all these different magnetic filings from all these different places, but still have them hold together under a sort of central, usually some central thematic question that I'm thinking about, you know, and wanting to explore. So I find it's really great for that. I feel like this is something we might have talked about briefly in Ireland, but I think we, we share the experience of we came up to where we are in poetry occasionally having to be the person to cut through the din in a bar filled with people, like a hundred people, only 10 of whom meant to show up to a poetry reading. And I feel like there are certain techniques that, that cut through that and anaphora is one of them. And honestly, I think that's a hard one skill, you know, <laughs> you need it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. It, and it, yeah, it, it's like anything to get their attention. <laughs> sometimes I, I remember that well um do we have any questions from anybody or are we how's our time going maris we're, we're just about done but you know um if if I'd someone love has a quick question. yeah oh, sure i mean please sandra yeah well i'm sorry i missed the verdict there what what are we doing <laughs> We're waiting for, we're waiting to see if perhaps someone has a question. Oh, okay. But maybe not. And maybe we end the evening um, just really grateful to Kim and Sandra for doing a beautiful, beautiful reading and uh, bringing some joy uh, into our Zoom. <laughs> Much needed. Um, a reminder, I, I posted links in the chat to buy both of their books, but that would be greatly appreciated um, if you did. And thank you to all of you for keeping the chat lively 
And um, thank you to our poets for just being wonderful. I'm really honored. Thank, thank, thank you guys so for coming. Thanks for Nellie Jackson book. Like, you, like, you guys are great. So how yeah. do you as well? Good night. Okay.